Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar on Buy American, What Government Contractors Need to Know. We appreciate you guys joining us. Hopefully we'll be able to share some good information with you guys today. So this is me, my name is Jackie Unger. I'm a partner in our government contracts group where our practice runs the gamut of helping government contractors navigate doing business with federal, state, and local governments. Uh, I help clients understand and deal with domestic sourcing requirements, like the stuff that we'll be talking about today. I also counsel clients on other FAR and SBA regulatory compliance issues and represent clients in False Claims Act investigations and in bid and size protests. And I also help with government and teaming partner uh, contracts and disputes. So that's a little bit about me and my background. I'll give our, our plug for the firm here at Polaro Maza. Uh, I work in the government contracts group here, and that's just one of several practice groups that we have. And we also have a labor and employment group, business and transactions, and litigation and dispute resolution groups. Um, and like many of the issues that we help our clients address, we'll be discussing today some topics that have crossover between a number of our different practice groups here. Um, if you're interested in staying up to date on recent developments impacting government contractors or just commercial businesses generally, uh, I recommend that you sign up for our newsletters and blogs at our website at poleromaza.com. So before we dive into the substance, I just want to give a little overview about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, first, I just want to give a brief overview of our federal domestic preference laws. And we'll dive into a little bit more detail about the Buy American Act and talk about its applicability, the country of origin test that applies to BAA, um, some exceptions where BAA doesn't apply, and we'll also talk about recent changes that have strengthened the requirements of BAA um, that are very important to know about these days. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the Trade Agreements Act, and so we can see how that differs from the requirements under BAA and when each of them applies. Um, and then I'll provide some compliance tips for complying with BAA and TAA and things you should keep top of mind. Um, and I will try to answer questions as we go along if I can, or if we have time, I'll address them at the end. And if I'm not able to get to them, um, then I will be sure to follow up with you via email or you can reach out to me via email if you have any questions. I think we do have a questions box here on the side through our GoToWebinar, so um, feel free to put any questions in there and then I will try to get to them as, as I'm able to. So first, I wanna give this really brief overview over federal domestic preference laws. There are a number of different statutory and regulatory regimes for carrying out the federal government's preference for the purchase of domestic products over foreign products. So we're not just limited to the Buy American Act. Um, we also have Trade Agreements Act, Ferry Amendment, various Buy America statutes. So uh, Buy American Act provides for preferential treatment for the purchase of domestic products and construction materials under federal government contracts while the Trade Agreements Act implements trade agreements guaranteeing non-discrimination of eligible foreign products, while at the same time prohibiting the purchase of ineligible products and services. So as I said, we'll talk about those two in a little more detail. Um, there's also the Berry Amendment, which requires that certain Department of Defense purchases, such as for food, clothing, certain textiles and tools, and specialty metals, be entirely grown or produced in the US. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna go into more detail on that today. Each of these could really have their own webinars, which we don't have time uh, for, but I wanna point these out so that you're aware of these other requirements that are out there. And then finally, we have Buy America, um, which is often referred to as the Buy America Act, but it's not really a single unified statute or a unified domestic preference program. Instead, that's the name that's given for domestic content restrictions that are attached to federal funds that are provided to states or local governments or other parties in the form of federal assistance, like grants or loans, but not through federal uh, procurements, through federal contracts. Um, these requirements generally apply to transportation projects using DOT funding, um, but other domestic preferences exist within specific agencies with their own unique rules for applicability and compliance. 
Um, one thing to be aware of with respect to Buy America requirements um, is that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was enacted last November, November 2021, included changes to Buy America requirements, including expanding the type of projects that are subject to the requirements, uh, including electric utilities and broadband infrastructure and real property and building projects. Um, and it also provides uniform requirements for these projects uh, to try to have more uniformity and consistency in the different types of Buy America restrictions that exist across agencies. Um, the, the IIJA directed federal agencies to have new rules in place by this May 14th, coming up quick. Um, and just recently on April 18th, OMB released guidance on the implementation of the new requirements. Um, so, you know, if you are working on infrastructure projects that are receiving federal funds, um, it, it would be wise to be aware of what these Buy America requirements are um, and understand some of these changes that are coming about through that recent act. Um, so we're not going to be talking about those today, uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and, you know, I'd be happy to dive into that a little bit more. Okay, so let's turn to the Buy American Act of 1933. Um, so first with our overview, um, the Buy American Act establishes a preference for the purchase of domestic end products and the use of domestic construction materials on certain federal contracts performed in the US. It's written like a prohibition by saying that foreign products are restricted, but in effect, it really works as a domestic preference through the price, evaluate, price evaluation adjustment that it applies. So it's not a strict prohibition on offering or, or purchasing foreign end products. The preference is provided through the use of a price evaluation adjustment to increase the price of a low foreign offer. Uh, so, in a civilian agency procurement, uh, if the low offer is for foreign end products, that low foreign offer will be increased by 20% if the lowest offer for domestic end products is a large business, or 30% if the lowest domestic offer is a small business. But if the foreign offer is still lower than the lowest price domestic offer, even after this price adjustment is added, then the agency can go ahead and make award to the foreign offer. So that shows that it's not a total restriction on purchasing products that use foreign materials in them that would be deemed a foreign end product. Uh, it's, it's just a consideration of uh, applying this adjustment and then seeing whether the price is still reasonable or not afterwards. Um, the, the preference is even greater for DOD procurements. Um, in those procurements, there's a 50% price adjustment that's applied to the lowest price for an offer. Uh, and that 50% doesn't change whether it's a, the dom lowest domestic offer is a small business or a large business. It's always going to be a 50% adjustment. Um, so again, an offerer can still offer foreign products, but this is a substantial increase. And usually this 50% increase tends to be determinative so that the domestic product will be lower priced. Um, I also want to point out that the price adjustment is only for purposes of the price evaluation and determining the awardee, but it doesn't actually uh, change the contract price. Um, it's, it's just used for the evaluation purposes. So if we can go to the next slide. So how do we know when BAA is applicable? Well, BAA applies uh, to all federal prime supply and construction contracts, but not contracts that are purely for services. And they have to have, the contract has to have an estimated value above the micro purchase threshold. However, uh, if the contract exceeds the trade agreements threshold, that tends to kick in around $180,000 for supply contracts and roughly $7 million for construction contracts, so we'll touch on that later, then the Trade Agreements Act kicks in and applies in place of the BAA. So really, BAA generally ap applies to contracts that are value valued between the micro-purchase threshold, which is around $10,000, and the TAA threshold of around $180,000. 
for uh, supplies. Um, but there are certain scenarios where the Trade Agreements Act doesn't apply, in which case it goes back to, or it may go back to the, the Buy American Act applying. Um, some of those situations where uh, contracts wouldn't be covered by the TAA regardless of the dollar value include contracts for arms, ammunition, war materials, or purchases indispensable for national security or national defense, uh, for sole source acquisitions, and for small business set-asides. In those situations, Buy American Act is going to continue to apply even above that TAA threshold. Um, and BAA generally applies only to contracts for products to be used or construction to be performed in the US. However, DOD does have special rules uh, included in the, it's called the Balance of Payments Program. Um, that program, those rules extend the Buy American Act restrictions to DOD procurements for supplies or construction outside the US, except for certain qualifying countries. So. You know, there's this general rule that BAA applies within the U.S., but if it's a DOD procurement, you need to look to see whether the balance of payments program applies, um, because then even if the supplies or construction are outside the U.S., uh, BAA may still apply to your contract. So next, I want to talk about um, the uh, Country of origin test. So how do you determine whether your product qualifies as a domestic end product or foreign end product? Um, and it's a two, well, for non-manufactured products to qualify as a domestic end product, the product must be mined or produced in the US. Um, for manufactured products, we have a two-part test to determine whether they qualify as domestic end products. The first part of the test is that the item must be manufactured in the US. The second part of the test is called the, the domestic content test. And that requires that the cost of the components mined, produced, or manufactured in the US must exceed 55% of the cost of all of the components. However, this goes up to 95% for products consisting wholly or predominantly of iron or steel or a combination of both. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the two parts of the test for manufactured products. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so the first part is that the item must be manufactured in the US. Um, unfortunately, there's no clear rule and no statutory or regulatory definition for manufacture. So, you know, there's kind of this gray area about whether the process will constitute manufacturing or not. Um, however, GAO has provided some guidance in its bid protest decisions about what constitutes manufacturing. Um, generally, it holds that manufacture is the operation whereby the identity and character is established and fixed as to its current and future use. Uh, this is uh, less stringent than the test used under the Trade Agreements Act, which requires substantial transformation of the product. So uh, when BAA applies, it, the process does not need to involve substantial or fundamental change to the physical character of the item for it to be manufacturing. Um, assembly of components may be sufficient to constitute manufacturing, but just packaging a product is not going to be enough. Um, for instance, assembly of a multifunction fax, printer, scanner, copier, and all its parts has been found to be sufficient because the product was not fully usable without that assembly process taking place. Um, however, a limited assembly that doesn't change the essential nature of the product would be insufficient. Uh, for example, GAO has found that the disassembly, substitution of parts, and reassembly in the US of a Japanese made commercial fax machine did not change the essential function and nature of the fax machine. So that did not constitute manufacturing. Uh, and GAO has also held that refurbishing in the US a cargo container from China by replacing floors and panels and fixing dents as needed 
and repainting it did not change the essential nature of the container. It started as a container and it stayed as a container, so that didn't constitute manufacturing that would be sufficient to meet the first part of the test. The test is applied on a case-by-case -case basis. It's this factual analysis, uh, so you really have to look at, you know, when the um, when did the product get its final identity and become usable in the way that the government wants to use it? Where did that process occur? So the second part of the test, which used to be called the component test, has been changed to now the domestic content test. Um, under part two of the test, the cost of the item's components mined, produced, or manufactured in the U.S. must exceed 55% of the cost of all of the components. This threshold, as I mentioned, this threshold increases to 95% for products consisting wholly or predominantly of iron or steel or a combination of both. A product consists uh, predominantly of iron or steel or a combination when the cost of the iron and steel content exceeds 50% of the total cost of the product's components. So you get to do a little bit of math under the BAA. Um, components that have an unknown origin are presumed to be foreign, so it's important to keep track of your component sources. Um, so what is a component? A component uh, is defined in the FAR as an article, material, or supply directly incorporated into an end product or construction material. Uh, and it, it's important to note that the, the costs of the component are measured at the component level, uh, not at the subcomponent level. Um, subcomponent cost is not considered, so it matters how you define the um, articles that make up your end product and whether you can define them as components or not. For purposes of calculating component cost, if the components are purchased, then the cost will be the acquisition cost, including transportation costs and applicable duties. If the components are manufactured, then the cost will include all costs associated with the manufacture of the components, but not with the process, the manufacturing of the end product itself, just of the components, um, including transportation and overhead, but not any profit. Um, so, you know, as I said, it, it's important how you define your components versus subcomponents. Um, as an example of that, GAO, in one case, GAO held that a toolkit, not the individual tools in the kit, was the end product. So the individual tools were the components, and only 55% of the individual tools needed to be domestic. If you broke that down to a further level, if each tool was considered an end product in and of itself, then you would need to have 55% of each tool's components be domestic. So it changes how you're looking at um, the different components and the different the costs that matter for the um, materials that go into that component. Um, so the definition here gives contractors some flexibility in how they're defining the components in a manner to maximize the likelihood that they'll qualify as a domestic end product. Um, but if you're in a situation where there are close calls about whether uh, an item is a component or a subcomponent, uh, it, it would be wise to disclose that to the contracting agency when you're making your certifications so that there's no argument that you're misrepresenting anything uh, if you're explaining how you're defining the end product and the component um, of, your, uh, of your offered products. So the next slide, um, I want to touch on the BAA's treatment of commercially available off-the-shelf items. So the FAR defines a COTS item as any item of supply, including construction material, that is a commercial item sold in substantial quantities in the commercial marketplace and offered to the government without modification in the same form in which it is sold in the commercial marketplace. 
A commercial item is defined in part as any item other than real property that is of a type customarily used by the general public or by non-governmental entities and that has been sold, leased, or licensed to the general public or has been offered for sale, lease, or license to the general public. The BAA test for COTS items is different from other items. Um, only the first part of the two-part test that I just explained uh, applies to COTS items. So that means that COTS items must still be, they must still be manufactured in the US but that domestic content test doesn't apply. Um, so, of course, there are always exceptions to the rule, and uh, the, this exception to the domestic content test for COTS items does not apply to COTS products that are made wholly or predominantly of iron and steel. So the cost of domestic components must still exceed 95% of total component costs for products consisting wholly or predominantly of iron or steel or a combination of both, even for COTS items, which effectively meant, means that pretty much the entire product needs to be made of um, US iron and steel or a combination, even when it's a COTS product. And one more point, there is an exception to the exception so that I can try to confuse you more. The domestic content test does not apply to COTS iron and steel fasteners because they're generally seen as being too difficult to track and they're largely interchangeable. So the government doesn't want to put that burden on contractors to have to uh, track that sourcing. So iron and steel fasteners are defined as a hardware device that mechanically joins or affixes two or more objects together and it includes nuts, bolts, pins, rivets, nails, clips, and screws. So COTS fasteners can be purchased without regard to their foreign iron and steel content. That 95% con US content requirement does not apply to COTS fasteners specifically that are made from iron and steel. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about the exceptions where BAA doesn't apply or where, where um, the purchase of foreign end products is permissible. So the first one I've already touched on, uh, an agency may acquire foreign end products if a specified exception exists uh, where there's an unreasonable cost of the domestic, the lowest price domestic end product. If a domestic offer is not the lowest offer, then the reasonableness is based on whether the domestic offer exceeds the lowest foreign offer, even after that adjustment that we talked about, that price adjustment to the lowest um, foreign offer of either 20 or 30%, depending on the domestic offer or size is made, or 50% for DOD procurements. If the domestic offer is still higher than the foreign offer even after the adjustment, then it, the price is determined to be unreasonable and award can be made to the foreign offer. Um, so really it comes down to, you know, if you wanna offer foreign products under BAA, you can do that but you wanna make sure that you're getting, a, you're able to offer a significantly lower cost so that even after this price adjustment of 20, 30, or 50% is applied to your offer, uh, that you'll still be competitive and have a chance of being that, that lower offer. Um, if a domestic, if, if it's possible to have a domestic offer that uh, beats your price with that adjustment added, then the award is gonna to go to the domestic offer. Uh, the next exception is for commercial IT acquisitions. Uh, the FAR defines information technology as any equipment or interconnected systems or subsystems of equipment that is used in the autom automatic acquisition, storage, analysis, evaluation, manipulation, management, movement, control, display, switching, interchange, transmission, or reception of data or information by the agency. It includes uh, computers, ancillary equipment, peripheral equipment um, designed to be controlled by the central processing unit of a computer, software, firmware, and similar procedures, 
services, including support services and related resources. Uh, but the definition of IT does not include any equipment that's acquired by the contractor incidental to a contract or that contains embedded IT used as an integral part of the product, but the principal function of which is not the acquisition storage analysis, evaluation, et cetera, of information. Like for example, for uh, HVAC equipment, like thermostats or temperature control devices and medical equipment where IT is integral to its operation, uh, those do not qualify as information technology. So, um, so if your products meet this defini definition for commercial IT acquisitions, then the Buy American Act will not apply to those acquisitions. Initially, it seems like this exception for commercial IT is helpful, um, but it's actually somewhat limited. Um, because commercial IT is largely procured through federal supply schedules, and GSA's position is that all schedules are subject to the Trade Agreements Act, not to Buy American Act. And so while there's this exception for commercial IT under BAA, that's not the case for TAA. There's no exception for commercial IT under TAA. So domestic sourcing restrictions that exist in TAA will apply to those schedule contracts. So this exception for commercial IT acquisitions is helpful where there are small standalone contracts um, for commercial IT between that micro purchase threshold and the TAA threshold. Um, but you know, if you're on the supply schedule, then TAA is going to kick in or if the uh, contract otherwise um, is a standalone contract, not on a supply schedule, um, but it's above that TAA threshold, then TAA will apply. And again, there's no exception for commercial IT acquisitions under TAA. So this exception is a little bit limited. Um, next, there's an exception where there's a non-availability of domestic end products or components. Um, this applies where the items are not mined, produced, or manufactured in the U.S. in sufficient and reasonably available quantities and of satisfactory quality. Um, those determinations can be made either on a, a class determination uh, basis or an individual basis. Um, the class determinations are listed in the FAR for all of the products that are uh, deemed to be non-available. And then an agency also has the ability to make individual determinations for a particular procurement um, if the, the items to be procured are determined to be non-available. For instance, if no do, uh, domestic offers are received. Um, there's an exception for the public interest. For this one, the head of the agency may determine that the domestic preference is inconsistent with the public interest. Um, this, this applies where there, where an agency has an agreement with a foreign government that provides a blanket exception to BAA. Uh, for instance, DOD has a number of agreements where qualifying country end products are treated as domestic end products. Um, those qualifying countries are listed in the uh, DFARS. So those would be exempt from BAA treatment. Um, and then last, there's commissary resale exception. This exception applies to items that are purchased by the contracting agency for resale at military bases. Okay, so with that background, now I want to talk about some of the recent changes that we've seen to BAA. Um, first, I want to go back to last year when Biden issued his executive order last January. Um, this is the executive order titled Ensuring the Future is Made in All of America by All of America's Workers. Um, it outlined the Biden administration's policy that the U.S. government should maximize the use of domestic products and services and should, whenever possible, procure goods, products, materials, and services from sources that will help American businesses compete in strategic industries and help America's workers thrive. So the executive order directed a few different things. It directed the FAR Council to consider proposing amendments to uh, the FAR in order to replace the component test, which is now considered the domestic content test with a value added test. Um, the value added test would measure domestic content by the value added to the product through US-based production or US job supporting activity 
but the executive order didn't really explain how that value would be calculated. So it kind of just left that up to the FAR Council to consider. Um, it directed the FAR Council to consider increasing the domestic content requirements and to increase price preferences for domestic end products, particularly for critical items. It also directed the FAR Council to consider removing the exception for IT, uh, IT uh, commercial IT, um, and it directed OMB to establish a Made in America office with a Made in America director. That has been done. The Made in America office has been set up and the director has been appointed. Um, and it requires that before an agency grants a waiver of the BAA, it must provide justification to the Made in America director. And also the executive order directed GSA to develop a public website with information on proposed waivers and whether they are granted. So that's been done as well. I have the website here, madeinamerica.gov. This is just to provide some uh, transparency and accountability for the waiver process. Biden wanted to try to narrow down, and Trump as well wanted to limit the circumstances when waivers are used, um, because there was quite a bit of waivers that agencies would try to use to get around by American Act requirements. Um, so they are thinking, okay, well, if we require that waivers be reviewed by the Made in America office, and if they're put online and made transparent, maybe as a sort of shaming saying you're using this waiver, then maybe it'll limit the use of the waivers a little bit. Um, and so the, the Made in America office doesn't necessarily accept or reject or make a determination on the waivers, but it's required that they have the opportunity to review it before the agency ultimately makes its decision and grants the waiver. Okay, so that's our background from the executive order. Since then, the FAR Council issued a proposed rule in response to that executive order last year in July and it issued its final rule in early March of this year, March 7th. So now I wanna talk about uh, what we actually got out of this recent final rule and how that impacts the Buy American Act. Um, the rule, first of all, the rule becomes effective October 25th, 2022, um, which is longer than rules normally become effective because the government wanted to provide a grace period for contractors to have some time to come into compliance with these new requirements. So the first big change is with respect to the domestic content requirements. Um, first of all, there's no discussion in the rule about replacing the domestic content test with the value added test that uh, Biden had mentioned in his executive order. Um, so we're not seeing any change to a value added test. We're going to stick with the domestic content test for now. Um, that may change down the road, but for now we stick with the domestic content test instead there's a phased increase to the domestic content thresholds over the next seven years. So as we've already talked about, the regulations currently require a product to contain 55% domestic components to qualify as domestic. The final rule increases the threshold to 60% as of October 25th of this year. That will be followed by an increase to 65% for items delivered in 2024 and an increase to 75% for items delivered in 2029 and beyond. Uh, there are no changes to the 95% domestic content requirement for products made of iron and steel. So that 95% is staying steady for those products made of iron and steel. These thresholds relate to uh, all other products. Um, for so so this potentially creates an issue for contracts that have a period of performance that spans over these different thresholds. Um, a contract, you know, particularly a long-term contract, a um, IDIQ contract might span multiple um, threshold increases. Under the proposed rule, that would have required contractors to comply with the threshold in place at the time of product delivery to the government. Um, many uh, commenters, stated that they had concerns with being required to potentially change their sourcing over the course of a contract to, to meet a higher requirement or with not being able to, for a fixed price contract, potentially know what the cost would be um, at that early stage of bidding on a contract, what that cost would be down the road if they're required, when they're required to increase the domestic content up to 75%. 
from 65%, say. Um, so that puts that burden and risk on the contractors. The final rule relaxes the requirement somewhat. This is still the default um, is to require that the contractor comply with the threshold in place at the time of product delivery to the government, but it does add a process for the agency to allow a contractor to use the domestic content threshold in effect at the time of contract award and to have that apply throughout the life of the contract. So you just be subject to the one threshold that applies at the time of contract award. But that process requires approvals from higher levels in the agency, and it requires notice to the Made in America office. So again, that's something that's not supposed to be done on every contract. Um, so you can't necessarily rely on that being the case. The default rule is that you will need to think about um, and be aware of the requirement that you may need to comply with higher thresholds over the course of your contract performance. The next aspect of this new final rule is that it establishes a fallback threshold. Uh, this implements a fallback threshold for products that meet the current domestic content threshold, 55%, but not the increased thresholds. This means that if the agency determines that there are no end products that meet the new domestic content threshold or that those products are unreasonably expensive, the agency will then treat offers that meet the 55% content threshold as domestic products. So you could imagine a situation where um, as of October, the end of October this year, the requirement is for 60% to be considered a domestic end product and say nobody submits um, an offer with products that are compliant at that level, um, but you may have an offer that meets the 55% threshold and maybe another offer that doesn't even meet that, that has 45% domestic content. Um, and so in that scenario, nobody meets the 60%. So the agency can then look at the 55% offer and treat that one as a domestic offer. And as long as it will apply that reasonable price test to that offer. Um, and if the, the product that is foreign, that, what did I say, 45% domestic content, if that's the lowest price, then the price adjustment would be applied to that one. And if the offer that has 55% domestic content uh, is lower with the price adjustment applied to the foreign offer, then the 55% domestic content offer uh, would be accepted. Um, so, uh, this, the, the intent here is to balance the need of smaller suppliers to adjust their supply chains while also rewarding um, suppliers who are able to take the lead and adopt higher content levels. Uh, you know, so, so uh, if those suppliers are able to bid and interested in bidding, then they're going to have the preference there. Um, but this also gives the ability for suppliers who are not able to make those changes right off the bat to have some time to adjust. Um, this fallback threshold will be in effect until 2030. And over that time, the threshold will always remain 55%. It's not going to increase as the other thresholds increase from 60 to 75%. This fallback threshold will always be 55%. Um, and, and so it will be important then when you're submitting your offer that you notify the government um, which of your products do meet the 55% threshold. So you, need, you would want to notify them of any that meet the 55% threshold and ones that don't meet that threshold. Those would be considered the, um, both would be foreign offers, but if the fallback threshold would apply, in that procurement, then the 55% offer would be considered domestic. Uh, the next aspect of the rule is that it creates a framework for the application of an enhanced price preference for critical items. Uh, the final rule states that the FAR Council will enact this enhanced price pre preference for critical products and critical components. This is this enhanced preference will be above the current 20% or 30% preferences. Um, it likely won't 
I, I don't know, I guess. I'm not sure if it will impact the DOD's 50% preference already, but it would be above the 20 and 30% preferences. But the final rule doesn't identify what those items are yet. That's going to be determined in a future rulemaking. Uh, the, the list will include, at that time, it will include any product or component that is deemed critical to the U.S. supply chain. So this plays into the Biden administration's goal of um, shoring up weaknesses in our uh, domestic supply chain for these critical services that we've seen shortages of, particularly through the pandemic that's enlightened us as to certain products and supplies that we want to encourage more production of domestically. Um, and so identifying which products are these critical ones um, is important for the BAA as well to be able to give those products this enhanced price preference. Um, so, so we should be on the lookout for a separate rulemaking that will create the official list and it will also identify the products uh, as well as the associated uh, price preferences that will apply. So a couple other points about the final rule. Um, the proposed rule would have required companies that supply critical items to report on the amount of the domestic content in the delivered products as a post-award reporting requirement as a measure of accountability. Um, but the final rule defers that requirement until the list of critical items is established. So it's not done away with altogether. Um, there probably will be post-award reporting requirements in the future. Uh, something that's something to look for in future rulemaking as well. And then finally, the rule maintains the exception for commercial IT and the partial exception uh, as to the domestic content test for caught items. So we haven't seen uh, changes there. So that, um, yeah, we can move on. That That's the recap of the Buy American Act and some important changes that we see um, that will hit us later in the year that we need to be aware of, as well as those changes that are um, those threshold changes that will come over the next several years and that we need to be on the lookout for future rules that are going to come out that will also have changes to BAA. So moving on to TAA, the Trade Agreements Act uh, establishes a prohibition, not a preference. So free trade agreements generally guarantee non-discrimination and government procurement among the signatory countries. And the TAA's purpose is to implement those free trade agreements uh, effectively by waiving the BAA for nations that have signed those agreements. So the result is that uh, designated country and products or services are treated as though they're made in the US. They get to be treated like uh, domestic end products. Um, unlike BAA, TAA prohibits end products or services from non-designated countries that don't have those free trade agreements. Um, designated countries are defined in the FAR. They include the World Trade Organization, government procurement agreement countries, other countries that have free trade agreements with the US, least developed countries, and Caribbean basic countries. Um, some notable non-designated countries are China, India, and Turkey. And Offeror may still offer non-designated country products when TA applies, but you need to disclose that uh, you're offering those non-designated country products and doing so likely will render those products ineligible um, unless a basis for a waiver to TAA exists. So the TAA applies to federal acquisitions when the estimated value based on the total contract value, including the options, meets or exceeds the applicable threshold. There are different thresholds for different free trade agreements, so it really depends on which free trade agreement um, you're looking at, where your product, what country your products come from, and when that free trade agreement kicks in. The majority of designated countries fall under the WTO GPA, and the thresholds for that are um, for supplies and services, $183,000, and for construction contracts, $7,032,000. Uh, and these thresholds 
as well as the other free trade agreement thresholds are updated every two years. These ones are the most recent from January of this year. Okay, so next I wanna talk about the test for determining the country of origin under TAA. And this depends on, it, it, the test differs depending on whether the contract calls for services or products. For services, the rule is um, the country in which the firm providing the services is established, not where the service is performed or provided, but rather where the firm is established. GAO has held that established means where it's incorporated or headquartered. So that one's a little bit easier to figure, it out, figure out. For products, the country of origin is either going to be the country where the article or product is wholly grown, produced, or manufactured, or if, an, if it's an article that consists of materials from multiple countries, it will be the country where the article has been substantially transformed into a new and different article of commerce with a name, character, or use distinct from that of the article or articles from which it was transformed. And this is called the substantial transformation test. And again, it's a, a fact-specific analysis based on all, the totality of the circumstance, and it's applied on a line item by line item basis. The determinative issue is really the extent of operations performed and whether the parts lose their identity and become an integral part of the new article as part of the process. Some of the factors that will be looked at are the extent of processing within a given country, whether the processing results in a new name, character, or use of the product, the resources that are expended on product design and development, the skill level required in the manufacturing process, and any key programming or customization that defines the product and its functionality. So I wanna run through a couple examples um, of how the substantial transformation test has been applied so you can kind of get a sense of how it works. Um, so courts and GAO have held that processing or assembly of components that already have a predetermined purpose is not su su uh, sufficient to find that there's been substantial transformation. So attaching handles to foreign pans and covers in the U.S. is insufficient. And likewise, fastening a foreign tool head together with a domestic wooden handle would be insufficient because the parts retain their original purposes. The ax head is cut and the handle helps with manipulation. So that's been found not to be sufficient. Um, for software, for CDs or hard media that contain computer software, they're substantially transformed at the location where the software is burned to or installed on a tangible medium. For intangible software, uh, that is held to be substantially transformed where the software build is performed, meaning where it's compiled and converted to object code. For products that include both hardware and programming, it depends on the functionality of the hardware without the software. Uh, hardware that's delivered without any programming and that then has software firmware downloaded onto the device generally is considered to be substantially transformed where the software or the firmware is developed and downloaded. But hardware that already is functional with generic software that perhaps is removed and then reprogrammed to install proprietary software and firmware uh, has been found to not to substantially change an end product because it does have that functionality already even without that uh, low level of customization. So again, it's really this fact-specific analysis, but that gives um, you know, a little bit of insight into how the, uh, how the test works. Oh, this slide, we just have this comparison of these main points between BAA and TAA that we've talked about. Um, so we can see the effect changes. There's a preference versus the prohibition, the preference uh, via the price adjustment, 
the applicability under BAA is for prime contracts for supplies or construction, whereas under TAA it applies to contracts for supplies, construction, or services. With the contract value, BAA applies above the micro purchase threshold um, until the TAA kicks in and applies. And then the TAA is based on uh, the different thresholds for the free trade agreements. The tests differ because BAA has this two part test and always requires that the end product be manufactured in the US. And then it generally requires at least 55% of the cost of all components from domestic components or 95% for those uh, iron and steel products. Um, and you know, only the manufacturer in the US being required for those COTS items. And then substantial transformation in the US is the test for TAA. And they each have their different exceptions uh, or waivers that might apply. We've already gone over the BAA ones. Um, Similarly, TAA has exceptions for small business set-asides, acquisitions of arms, ammunition, et cetera, for national security, certain sole source acquisitions, acquisitions of end products for resale, acquisitions from the federal prison industries and Ability One, certain services varying by the trade agreement, for instance, transportation, utility, R&D, services supporting military ser services overseas, um, similar to BAA, TAA has a non-availability exception if there are no offers for domestic end products and a DOD national interest uh, exception. So when the, for these exceptions, if TAA does not apply because of these exceptions, BAA may continue to apply instead. So you shouldn't think, you know, if okay, TAA should apply, but one of these exceptions applies, therefore there's no domestic source restrictions that apply to um, my contract. Don't take that approach. First, think back and consider whether BAA may apply instead. Um, I do want to touch on a couple of small business points. Um, as I noted, for small business set-asides, BAA applies. Uh, TAA does not apply to small business set-asides. Um, with respect to federal supply schedules, I mentioned earlier that TAA generally does apply to federal supply schedules. However, if a special item number under a given schedule is set aside, then BAA will apply to that special item number. And TAA and BAA applicability flow down from the federal supply schedule contract down to the order level. So TAA would apply to orders that are placed under non-set aside SINs, and BAA applies to orders placed under set-aside SIMS. I also want to briefly touch on the intersection of domestic sourcing requirements and SBA's rules on small business manufacturing. So under SBA's rules, to qualify as a small business for a supply contract, a firm must either manufacture the product itself or qualify as a non-manufacturer. To qualify as a manufacturer, the firm must make the product in the U.S. There can only be one manufacturer of a product, and that is the concern which, with its own facilities, performs the primary activities in transforming inorganic or organic substances, including the assembly of parts and components, into the end item being acquired. Uh, so, you know, you either need to meet that definition and make the product in the U.S. as a small business, or you need to qualify as a non-manufacturer. Um, and to do that, the firm must resell a product made by a small business in the U.S. It is possible for SBA to issue waivers that allow a non-manufacturer to sell a product made by any size business without regard to the place of manufacturer. But that waiver, even though it says that it allows for selling a product of any size business without regard to the place of manufacturer, that does not waive or affect BAA or TAA requirements that may apply to the procurement. That's been addressed in a number of GAO decisions as well. So if the procurement is a small business set aside and SBA issues a waiver of the non-manufacturer rule, then BAA will still apply since it's a small business set aside. So you can't assume that a waiver of the non-manufacturer rule also waives any domestic sourcing restrictions that apply outside of SBA's rules. 
Okay. Moving on, so that's our overview of BAA and TAA, those upcoming changes uh, for BAA. Now I wanna talk, I see we've only got a few minutes left. Sorry, there's so much information here to go through. I know this stuff is pretty complicated too. But I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some compliance tips, um, things that you should be thinking about um, you know, as you're reviewing your contracts of solicitations, um, how you can com best comply with these different requirements. So first at the, solicita at the solicitation stage, um, you know, you should note that agencies and prime contractors often include the wrong BAA, TAA clauses, or they might include both BAA and TAA clauses in solicitations or flow downs in the um, subcontract um, when really they should be choosing one or the other. It's because this stuff is really complicated. So it's not that uncommon to just see the agency or prime contractor just throw in everything, um, which isn't really the right approach. So you should look for those clauses and raise questions regarding applicability with the procuring agency or the prime contractor before you submit your offer or before you sign a subcontract. Um, you wanna make sure you understand what the correct domestic sourcing requirements are and which ones will apply to your procurement. You should also not assume that BA and DA, TAA do not apply if the contract clause is omitted if they should be omitted. Under the Christian doctrine, um, the courts hold that if a contractor requirement is required by law, as it may be under the Buy American Act or the Trade Agreements Act, it will be that requirement will be read into the contract even if the clause is omitted. So if you think that there should be a restriction there and the agency happened to forget it, you aren't necessarily free, uh, doesn't mean you won't have a, a problem there. Um, if you think that the agency has included the wrong clauses or that they should be included where they're not, then you should consider a pre-award protest at GAO or the Court of Federal Claims um, if the agency isn't receptive to changing those clauses in communications with them. Okay, so next, you wanna make sure that your certifications are accurate. Obviously, compliance is really important. Um, making sure your certifications is really important um, in terms of, because you could face audits and investigations that could lead to False Claims Act cases or liability if your certifications are not accurate. Um, it could also lead to being vulnerable to post-award protests if there's reason to believe that your certifications weren't accurate and you didn't, uh, not going to provide a compliant product. Um, or the contract could even be terminated if it turns out that the um, certification wasn't accurate or you're not complying with the requirements. Um, and you could be on the hook for re-procurement costs for the agency. So very important to make sure that you're compliant. So the key here, I, I've laid out the um, key clauses that apply and there are certificates where you make your certifications about which of your products are compliant count, constitute domestic end products and which do not. Um, the key here is to understand that unless you specifically list the products that are not compliant, you are certifying that all of your products are compliant. Um, and these certifications are ongoing. So if you have a change with your sources in contract performance, you should notify the government prior to making that change in sourcing to allow them to determine how they wanna proceed. If it might change the impact from qualifying as a domestic offer to a foreign offer. Um, and these certifications may be made as part of your proposal that you actually are submitting, or it might be through the certifications that you're making in SAM. Either way, if you have a product that you know is a foreign end product, you need to specifically list that. Otherwise, you are making the representation that you will provide only domestic end products. Um, I find that, an, you know, and I've seen many contractors miss that and not understand that they are making that certification that they'll provide only compliant products um, by not saying anything. Um, and let's see, so uh, you, if you're not sure whether your product complies or not, whether it's domestic or foreign, um, you can seek to have a country of origin determination made by um, Customs and Border Protection. 
Um, they can issue advisory rulings that are non-binding as well as final determinations that are binding. So that could give you some clarity if you really just don't know whether you, you know what your uh, product would um, be domestic or foreign. All right, next. Okay, next compliance tip is to establish and follow internal processes. You want to have internal policies and procedures that relate to BAA and TAA. You may want to identify an individual or a department that's responsible for ensuring that the requirements are understood and are met, that you have uh, certification protocols in place, that you um, identify the certifications that are expected from your subcontractors and your suppliers, that you have a process set up for monitoring compliance with subcontractors and suppliers. You should consider training your employees so that they will understand which laws apply and any relevant exceptions or waivers and, and you know, how to determine whether products qualify as domestic or foreign under the test that we talked about. You should also make sure to maintain accurate records of the origin of your components and your end products so that there, if there is an audit or investigation, you have those documents in place to show, hey, here's everything we're doing to, to be compliant and for the specific products, here's what I can show you to show the sourcing um, and that it does qualify as domestic. And finally, on the next slide, uh, some compliance tips for considering the prime sub relationship. It's really important to note that the BAA and TA requirements, those FAR clauses, are not mandatory flow downs. So, as a prime contractor, you need to determine if a flow down is necessary. And if so, you need to include the appropriate FAR clause in the subcontract to make sure that your subcontractor will be subject to those requirements as well. Ultimately, it is the prime contractor's responsibility to ensure compliance when BA or TA applies. So if your subcontractor is not compliant, then you've got a problem there if you fail to include that requirement in the subcontract. Best practice for primes when flow down is necessary is for the prime to obtain a certificate of compliance from its subcontractor that the products are compliant with BAA or TAA or to have them identify just as the prime must do um, any products that constitute foreign end products. So there's a question of how far do you really need to go when you're investigating the subcontractor's compliance? Um, and courts have addressed this issue and they generally come to the conclusion that the, uh, a prime reseller can rely on its supplier's certifications. It doesn't have to conduct its own country of origin due diligence of supplied products. And it doesn't like, for instance, it doesn't have to inspect the supplier's manufacturing process. But if a prime contractor becomes aware of a supplier's non-compliance or if there's credible evidence, basically like a red flag that to contradict a certification um, or that there may be non-compliant products, then the prime does need to take action um, to investigate that further and to uh, make sure that they're being compliant. Um, so you need to think about, you know, is there any reason to doubt the sub-certification? And then finally, we recommend that you use appropriate risk shifting provisions. Basically, um, you know, you want to require indemnification for any damages or liability as a prime that you would face for non-compliant products and false certifications that come about due to your subcontractors or your suppliers non-compliance with those BAA or TAA requirements. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as you're drafting those agreements as well to try to include those sorts of provisions in there. Um, and with that, I will wrap it up. Um, I, we're, I see we're already <laughs> over the time. I apologize for that. Um, I, there's just so much here to go over, and I know that each of these different areas, BAA, TAA, Buy America provisions, Barry Amendment, and more, really can have their own one-hour, multi-hour uh, webinars here, so we're trying to pack a lot into a little bit of time. Um, I, you know, I see that we have some questions here.
Um, I will try to follow up with you to answer those questions. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you, you know, besides these ones, so, so I'll have a record of these and I will follow up with you guys to get you answers for this. And then if you have other questions still that you didn't ask during this webinar, please feel free to email me. My email is here on the slides um, and I'm happy to answer those questions. If you have any BAA, TAA compliance issues, also happy to help with those as well. So please feel free to reach out. Again, I appreciate everybody taking the time for the webinar today. Um, thank you. We will um, hopefully see you join another webinar soon.